Welcome back to Twin Tech 2020. I hope you've been enjoying yourselves today uh, in our breakout sessions or networking. I'm hearing a lot of buzz about networking. I love the fact that in synchronicity calls, we're going to do another one this evening, so be ready for that round. You never know who you're going to run into. In, in fact, I've heard from a few people that they've run into people they already knew well, and it was a great five minutes to reconnect, and other people they'd never met before. So as we say at Twin, never leave serendipity to chance. I'm, I'm here with my very good friend and Twinian, or we were joking before the segment that sort of like twins. It's like you know Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. I'll let you decide who is who on this stage. <laughs> but uh, Sam and I are going to have a great conversation in a little bit. But before I do, uh, a few notes about this evening, about our program, about tomorrow. First of all, as I mentioned earlier today, we're going to have a lot of fun in these two and a half days. We're going to talk about the future, what's beyond the pandemic. But we always do so mindful of the challenges that this difficult year has posed to so many people. Whether that's the pandemic, of course, that has affected many of our friends and relatives, and in some cases, us individually, uh, or the economic challenges that have been faced, the fires, the, the, the explosion in Lebanon, a very long list of very challenging situations. So everything we do here is to look to the future to help make it better, but always mindful and empathetic for the challenges people are facing. Now, regarding tomorrow, we have a number of opportunities. In the morning, I'm very excited about this, and we enter this with a little bit of trepidation, because as we've all noted, we've never done this before. In fact, before about eight months ago, most of us had not even been on a Zoom call, much less produce a program like this with all the moving pieces uh, online. And we're so glad you're here with us, and the outpouring of support and engagement has really been exciting. So sessions I'm very excited about tomorrow in the room. This is where we're going to have some of the greatest speakers from past twin events, actually some of the greatest speakers in the world, our fellow Twinians, who are going to spend 45 minutes with each of you in person on the screen. So I urge you to come early and often during that time to join each other. Make sure that you show up on time. And, and please, if a room gets to 20 people, just understand that's a law of physics for us. It's full. You can still watch it, but I'd highly recommend going and finding another room because part of the magic is actually being on the screen and interacting with your fellow Twinians. That's up to you. That would be my recommendation. Now, in the afternoons, our great sponsors, Exelon, Griffith Foods, and, and Anthem, have helped to support multi-hour breakout sessions about digital health, the future of energy, and, uh, and food and agriculture going forward. I urge you to find the link in the logistics email that I, in the content email that I sent out over the weekend and join one of those sessions. Obviously, again, laws of physics, join one of those sessions. Um, with that, uh, I, I'm so pleased to be here with Sam Glassenberg, a good friend, a Twinian for, I don't know, probably five or six years at now, least, I'd say. At least. Yeah, and, and you've been on our stage a couple of times before. Uh, and you're certainly going to be on this, this new virtual stage here. And then later on, after Sam and I chat uh, uh, about our topic, we're going to pipe in some other Twinians, Dorit de Noviel, Sridhar Iyengar, and Slava Rubin, who are all waiting in the wings. And you can't see them in cyberspace, but I can see them uh, making faces at us there on the screen. So I'm really excited for this segment because when I was thinking about serendipity, never leave, leaving serendipity to chance. I was thinking about what we can learn, and I was preparing a session with David Krakauer at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, you'll see that during our finale on Thursday. And David, is, as always, is a brilliant raconteur and scientist. He likes to study stupidity because everybody else studies intelligence. Everybody else studies performance. He says, let's study what went wrong. And I remember back in uh, our global in 2015, Slava Rubin was on our stage. You'll hear from him later. And he said, I think we should have failure classes in junior high school. And we're going to pick that apart a little bit later to understand what that means. Because we can learn so much from mess ups, or as we like to call them here, screw up stories. Screw up stories, or our acronym FUS. Uh, what, what's all the fuss about? You can probably figure out you know, what's going on here, but I'm not going to say it. And I could not think of a better person to talk about screw-up stories than my good friend, Mr. Sam Glassenberg. Sam. Flattered to be here. <laughs> Glad you thought of me when you had to think about who are the biggest screw-ups 
in, in, in my life, who can I well, invite Sam Glassenberg? Well, you know, when somebody has the accomplishments and the tough skin and the self-awareness and the humility that, that you do, you can handle that uh, because not only does he have some great uh, uh, screw-up stories, he also has some extraordinary successes. Tell us one recently, Level X, your company, uh, was purchased by yes. Brain Labs yes. in a very successful exit, and you picked up a partner a couple years ago via Twin. We did. We, tell us about that briefly. Briefly. So, Level X, my company makes video games for doctors. We were acquired by Brain Lab. They're a large medical technology company out of Europe. They do. The reason why neurosurgery has the reputation for being cutting edge is largely because of Brain Lab. Um, years ago at Twin, um, uh, I met Dorit, um, who I gave a talk, and I remember Twin was running late. We were running like 20 no, that minutes late. that never happened. Stop. And, Just don't and, listen to And I to was him. running late for a meeting, and I'm walking off stage, and I'm handing my card to people because I'm trying to get to my meeting, and Dorit comes up to me, and she goes, hi, oh, Sam, I'd like to talk to you. And I go, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm late for something. Here's my card. And she goes, no. <laughs> you want to talk to me now. Said, Why? She goes, I... I'm in charge of TRISH, the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. Right. We work with NASA to find terrestrial technologies that we can use to help prepare ourselves for the deep space missions to Moon and Mars. I said, you're right. I do need to talk to you. I do need to talk to you. <laughs> and that, was, and that became, became a, a wonderful partnership. We've been working with them to utilize our game technology and our design to help prepare astronauts for the various space health emergencies that they may encounter on on deep space missions. So we're preparing for screw ups in space. Yes, well, I, I dare say your story, Sam, suggests that you had a near screw up moment. Yes. You nearly blew off Dorit de Noviel, and as we've all learned, no one does that. Correct. That's just, in the space community, nobody does that. Correct, okay. so that was that is a lesson learned. Yes. What are the lessons that we learned from our screw ups and our there near screw ups? Yes. Well, speaking of that, you have a couple of stories you're, you're willing to share. Uh, I haven't signed the waiver, I don't think, but you're willing to share. So share one of them, and you get extra points for humor, but share one screw-up story, and what can we learn from it? Okay, and so then I'm, I, I may lose points then, but we'll, we'll try. <laughs> so, okay. Um, well, I guess I, the best, the best, best screw-up story I come up with is probably me as the screw-up, okay. as the screw-up of the family. Okay. And it's actually, it lends, its, it sort of lends itself into sort of how Level X got started because it's all a screw-up story. Um, so I've spent my career in the video game business. Yeah. Uh, I was at LucasArts making Star Wars games. I was at Microsoft. My last company, which was also acquired, made games for Hollywood movies. Now before that, I had a whole bunch of screw-ups because I tried to make games based on, uh, for, with the music industry, and I tried to make games with all sorts of companies that went bankrupt, and I have terrible screw-up stories. But, so wait a minute, let's stop there for a second. Because I thought Albert Einstein said something like trying to solve, do, do the same thing over and over again and getting a different result is, somebody said that's, that, that's right? That's stupidity, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, not and true, so apparently. you were doing that. Not oh. true. Not oh, true. it eventually works out. Right. Okay. I guess this is a, maybe this is like a quantum mechanics thing versus general ah, relativity. You're right, you're right. It's uh, like entanglement or exactly. something. Exactly. Weird action okay. at a distance. Great, okay. Fine. Very good. Um, so yeah, so I'm the, so all this game stuff has basically made me the screw up of the family because I come from <laughs> a long line of successful serious doctors. Okay. Right. So I'm all working right. in the video game as business. opposed to the non-serious kind. Right. Of exactly. Doctor. Exactly. There's 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 right. Okay. My, my grandfather was a famous doctor. My parents, they're both doctors. My wife is a doctor. My aunts and uncles. I'm the screw up that never went to medical school. Okay. I'm all messing right. around with this video game nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shana Tova, by the way. Happy New Year. Yes. Happy New Year. Yes. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, Jewish, yeah, the, the, to give you a sense, so yeah, so in 2000, when I was at Microsoft, in 2006, I accepted a technical Emmy on behalf of my team's work at Microsoft. An Emmy Award. Right, this was, yeah. would you think, would imagine, you know, in, would be a, a, a big a thing big in deal. a family, right? Yeah. We say in, in the Jews, we say you'd have a lot of nachas, like it'd be pride. Okay. But no, because I'm the screw up, because, so I, I went to call my parents and let, give, tell them the good news, yeah. and they pick up the phone, my mother says, you have to tell your father. And he gets on the phone, and without skipping a beat, he goes, Sam, this, this news is very nice, um, the red carpet and everything, but in this family, we only recognize Nobel Prizes. He goes, you're not yet 30 years old. You can still go to medical school. I'll yeah. pay for it. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. Because <laughs> for us, the fetus is only viable when it graduates from medical school. Okay. This is, we, we you know, the, um, so this was, this, was, this was the screw up. I, I never went into medicine. Um, basically, my father got so frustrated 
that finally, I was, 2000, I was in my 30s, uh, it was 2012, he goes, all right, Sam, I give up. Put all this video game nonsense to good use. Make me a game to train my colleagues to do a fiber optic intubation. It's this tricky procedure. You only do it on difficult patients. For so I see- For pulmonologists, right? For anesthesiologists. Anesthesiologists, and emergency okay. Med. He goes, we see people screw this up all the time because you have to practice and you can only practice rarely. So people screw this up all the time. He goes, make yeah. me a game they can play on their phones. So basically- So I'm, this was your dad's idea? This was my dad's idea. I oh. cannot take any credit for this. Okay. This was him trying to make something of me. Great. This, this screw up. Yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, so make me a game that'll play on their phones. And so out of guilt, uh, <laughs> happy new year, um, yeah. I, I sit down and I throw together this terrible little game um, that I make in three weekends because I'm busy running the game company trying right. to make games for movies. And, um, and so I sit down, I make him this game, I upload it to the app store because I'm too busy running a game company to install it on his friend's phones one by one. Here's the link, let him download it, leave me right. alone. Two years later, he calls me up and he says, how many people downloaded the game? Two years. Two years, it was two years. I had paid, I paid no attention to this. I was, this is whatever this thing for my dad. Right. Um, and so I go, I, Dad, I have no idea. I'll check for you. I went and I looked, and we had 100,000 doctors, nurses, and airway specialists worldwide who'd been playing this thing. So I Google it, and I discover, unbeknownst to me, they've been doing efficacy studies on this piece of crap that shows it improves physician performance. So this entire thing, so like this all just comes out of, you know, sort of the big career mistake wow. followed by making a terrible, terrible product that by game standards would never meet the bar and demonstrated at least that there is a lot of demand for this sort of thing in the medical business, wow. which is what started the whole idea of making a company that makes games for doctors. So the visual quality was sort of like Pong for doctors or something, Yes, right? I would say Nintendo yeah. 64. But oh, this okay, was like, a little better. But I mean, yeah. there was, was, this was 2012, it was 10 yeah. years later. Right. More. Wow. Well, that's great. And the rest is, is history, as they say. So is there, is there anything we can learn from, from this? Listen, I would say listen to your parents. Is that the, the, usually uh, the thing you don't want to uh, hear? Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, I mean, what else can we learn from? Yeah. I don't know. Um, we'll guilt figure, is a powerful force. We'll figure something out. You know what? You were listening to a customer you didn't even know was a customer. There you go. How about that? And you know what? That happens in other businesses as well. I remember years ago a famous story from Intuit. So you might recall that Intuit's QuickBooks, or Intuit's Quicken, was for personal uh, financials. And after a number of years of growth, they started getting all these calls from users. And the calls were people saying, hey, can't we, uh, I, wanna, I wanna do invoicing for my small business. And the help desk would say, well, Quicken's not for that. And then somebody would call and say, how do I use this to file my taxes for my small business? They say, well, you don't understand, this is not for small businesses. <laughs> and then they started hearing this and they realized, wait a minute, all these individuals who love Quicken, uh, love uh, Quicken, are trying to do stuff for the small business. There's a customer there, so that's where QuickBooks came from, and it quickly became well over half of their business. Yeah. And so it was a customer they didn't even know they had. But well, that's a fabulous story, Sam, and we'll come back to more later. I want to now shift to our friends in cyberspace, uh, and so if we could, if we could call Dorit Denoviel. Uh, uh, Sridhar Iyengar and Slava Rubin all to the stage, and there they are. Good to see all of you. Let's have a wave. Great, that means you can hear me. So uh, it, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I do look forward to the next time we can be together in person, but this is a good proxy. So um, I'd like to ask each of you, and we're gonna go round robin, to share a screw up story of some sort. And I know this was hard work for all of you because you're all immensely successful and capable. Please read their bios online. We're not gonna waste our time with that here. But uh, I know you had to dig deep to find uh, a mistake or a screw up in your background, but you're all humble and open enough to share. Uh, I'm gonna start with Dorit, since you've already been featured on our segment this evening. Dorit, share a story, and, and you're in the science space, so I'm always interested in how this relates to science. Dorit Denoviel. So a lot of what's happened in my life is basically serendipity, right? And I love, I love what you always say about that. So I had to dig deep because I work with the space program and in the space program, failure is literally not an option. I mean, tiny mistakes can end up having people dying and 
cost billions of dollars. So um, I will just share a personal story with you. I ended up in the coolest job in the world after a pretty major screw up. Um, when this institute was being formed and uh, NASA was looking for um, um, us to do innovation for them around healthcare in space and deep space, um, I was going through some personal challenges and opportunity came up after this institute was formed and I was able to, to uh, compete in this position and, and take over. So I didn't end up where I was because of personal issues. I don't know if that's a screw up or not, uh, but sometimes, you know, the timing isn't right and you end up, um, you know, having to make decisions that later you regret. But I ended up landing on my feet. That's about the only personal story um, that I think is interesting at all. But as you know, um, a lot of screw ups in, in science um, ended up in, in amazing technologies and innovation. Yeah, so I'd love to come back to that that point. Maybe you can share a quick story that we're not aware of. We all know about uh, penicillin and some of the the microwave oven. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's one of my favorites. There were researchers at Lockheed, and they were studying microwaves. And at the time, they didn't realize it really wasn't a good idea to stand next to a microwave emitter. But anyway, we learned. And so some of the researchers brought their bagged lunch in. And one of the researchers put the lunch on top of the machine and came back for lunch and found out that the food was hot and couldn't figure it out and then did it again the next day and he said, aha, hey, I think there's something here. And that's where the microwave oven came from. So uh, that's a good start. Uh, Sridhar Iyengar, you're on next. What is your screw up story and what can we learn from it, if anything? Well, I've got a number of screw ups. Uh, uh, I guess I have to say one thing to to, to Sam's point. Um, my, my, I'm I'm of Indian origin, and uh, Indian mothers and and Jewish mothers are, I think, on the same cloth. So I, I still get a lot of uh, uh, questions as to why I'm not a real doctor. Cause I, I only have a PhD. I'm not a medical yeah. doctor. So. Yeah. By the way, PhD um, means fake doctor. doctor. Yeah. I don't know if you know yeah. that. I mean, yeah. it's oh, the PhD. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, so. I thought about this, and um, I think probably the, the the best way to talk about this is my entire career um, uh, is, is based on the fact that I tried to completely uh, intentionally screw up my scholarship uh, interview, as I, I I had applied for a, a international scholarship to study in the UK for graduate school. Uh, only because my mom yelled at me uh, the night before the application was due. So I applied and whatnot. Um, ultimately, I got the interview. And I was dead set that I was going to drop out of academia and be a heavy metal rock and roll drummer, which I'm still intending to do, but I can't grow wait, the hair wait. from that. So that's, that's serious. You want to be a heavy metal rock and roll drummer? Well, more more prog rock. I'm big into Rush and Primus. So, oh, uh, we, and but, obviously, you know our good friend and fellow Twinian, Martin Wazowski. He, used to, he was the fifth member of ABBA. And so maybe you guys can get together. I know Martin very yeah. well. Yes, we talked. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So keep going. Yeah. Yeah. No, but what what ended up happening was um, I had not prepared at all, uh, and I was just going to this interview um, for uh, just to make my mom happy, um, which I'm still <laughs> trying 25 years later. Um, and they had asked me a little bit about my personal interests and all that, and it turned out that the day before. I had finished a gig in Chicago, and I'd taken an early morning flight down to Atlanta where I was interviewing. And, and I was telling them, look, 12 hours ago, I was in a smoky bar. And I had really no intention of, uh, of, of pursuing an academic career at that time. But it turned out that they loved it. And half the interview was around drums and uh, music, and they asked me to do a drum solo with my hands on the tabletop. And I go into this with the intent of, of, of doing one thing, and then the universe conspires <laughs> and says, uh, yeah, your, your, your dream of being a, a musician, not going to happen. I ended up going, doing a PhD in the UK, and that uh, the work I did there became the basis for my first company, and it led to my second company and to my third company. And, and Slava knows me and my co-founder very well from the work we did in our second company together. So yeah. um, the whole thing was serendipity and uh, the universe conspiring against it. So, Yeah, yet again, everybody on, on the screen with us today has extraordinary successes in the past, but also beautiful humility. Um, so, uh, Sridhar, it sounds like the PhD program you applied to had a very rigorous selection process. They were, They had really gone through and knocked that one out of the park, huh? 
<laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to say my professor uh, ha had attended some of my gigs when I was playing in graduate school. So oh, really? I consider that a win. Yeah. Wow, that's that's exciting. So uh, th thanks a lot for that. You went in intending to 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 bail out, and yet life took you in another direction. Often how it I'm, works. I'm a failed musician. Failed music. <laughs> Great. Now, uh, I want to come back to you a little bit later and talk about your transition from academia to business, because I thought that was a really insightful conversation we had a couple years ago. Slava Rubin, you're on next. You're on the hook. Uh, what do what you got for us? Screw up story. Your F-U-S. By the way, F-U-S means what's all the fuss about, right? So anyway, you can fill in the blanks. Slava. So actually, uh, just before this uh, panel was going to start, I'm now a venture investor. Yes. And one of the uh, entrepreneurs who I was talking to sent me an email and in the bottom he had a quote and I was like, this is perfect because this is exactly what I believe in timely for this talk, which is good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> good judgment <laughs> comes from experience and ex no. Experience comes from Bad, bad judgment. judgment. Ah, experience, good. Keep going. I'm taking notes. So yeah, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So uh, Indiegogo started in 2006, my previous company, and we launched in 2008. And you know, let's call it 2018. People are like, wow, you know, the company is doing great. What's it like being an overnight success? So <laughs> I then have to tell them the story, which is perfect for this which is in the early days of Indiegogo, we got rejected by 93 VCs in a row before anybody would give us a dollar. This is over the course of almost three years and through the market crash of 2008. So only because we literally screwed up everything and made all the failures and were too dumb to fold, were we able to then persevere and then succeed off of our experience from before and start to do things correctly. People also will say, wow, first time entrepreneur, first time success, that's a good hit rate. I tell them pretty much the first company I failed for the first couple of years and I was lucky enough to still run the same company, you know, second time over. Right. So that's basically uh, the situation. In terms of a more specific story, I would say that, you know, we thought we were very smart when we launched Indiegogo and we had six calls to action above the fold, whether it was to great, engage, and then there was fun. And for some reason, it wasn't working that well. And we would ask our customers, you know, what is Indiegogo about? And everybody would have six different answers or a hundred different answers. And finally, when we were on death's doornail, about to run out of money, not being able to, you know, even work on it anymore, we just said, you know what? Let's just carve out and cut apart 80% of the code, rip it apart, throw it out, which was a, hard, a lot of hard work to do because we worked on it so much. And let's just keep the fun button. Just one button. And one button for what? One button for what? Just fun. fun. Oh, okay. okay. And now it seems so obvious, right? But in the early days, we had too many buttons and we thought we were too smart. And it was only because we were you know, dying and our customers were telling us, hey, this is not working, that we then just ripped it all out, went with fun, and then we were off to the races. So you had all these grand plans. You had, you had done your coding magic to create this extraordinary edifice. And what you really needed was a single button. That's exactly right. And you needed the that was easy button. Exactly. I'll tell you, no joke, I share this story with entrepreneurs now almost every time I speak to them. If they're not a repeat entrepreneur, they usually have not learned this lesson. And I call this the octopus versus the ant story. An octopus is one of the smartest animals in the wild, and it will use all of its tentacles to try to break through saran wrap. Because it's smart, it'll try to break through and it'll keep on pushing equally across all the different tentacles across the saran wrap. But the saran wrap won't give because it's not focused enough and the octopus is trying too hard. The ant doesn't have a lot of brain power. The ant just has its little pincers in its front and you tell it to break through the saran wrap, all it knows is to go straight. Just keep on trying more and more on that small little thing. And eventually the saran wrap breaks. And it's amazing, literally through my bad judgment, because I did a terrible job of creating product, I had a terrible result, and then learned how to create a better product. And because of that, now I have good judgment, and I share that as a VC. 
So that's my, uh, my story. Well, so Slava, coming back to your, your uh, astute recommendation from a few years ago to have failure classes uh, for junior high school students, uh, given your vast experience with this, how, how do you explain, how do you share bad judgment with junior high school students to help them understand failure better? And this is a question then for everybody. What do we need to know about mistakes or failure to be more effective in addressing them and get, finding the silver linings, perhaps? I'll start with Slava, and then Sam, you can mention if you want to. You know, I now actually have a, a, a four and a half year old and a two and a half year old, and it's very clear that they are not yet molded by social macro contract. They still have to figure it all out on themselves, and they definitely don't listen to mom and dad. So when I tell them that that's wet or that's hot, or right. you know, you're not going to be able to climb that ladder or whatever, they rarely listen and they have to figure it out for themselves. So, by the way, you're saying you have boys. That is correct. Too. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I have daughters, they listen to me for now, but in about a year and a half, that will start to change. Right, that is correct. <laughs> and sometimes, not only do they not listen to me, they surprise me and themselves what they're capable of doing and figuring out, okay? And that's just remarkable. And sometimes they learn exactly what I told them and then they won't do it again on their own. And the right. thing is, until we're five, six, seven, we have that creative energy and having to decide for our own whether or not it is true or not true and in the process fail or not fail. And we're okay with that. But then over time, as we go through the school system and we need to get A's and we need to learn to do well, and if it's not an A, it's a bad result, we start to just follow, quote unquote, the rules and we stop to test reality and we stop to test what is true versus not true for ourselves. And I just think that more of that needs to happen and we need to empower our kids uh, any age to test things and to figure it out for themselves. Um, because the world we live in, the rendezvous we're using now, the lights that somebody invented those things and somebody before them told them they were crazy. So the, the chairs you're sitting on, somebody created, and now we get to benefit from it. But from the people that were creating them, the other people next to them said they were nuts. Yeah. So I just think we need to allow ourselves, especially our kids, to be wrong, to fail, to get Fs, and to go beyond the boundaries of feeling comfortable. And in the process, learning, you rarely learn from good experiences. Yeah. You know? Well, actually, science is pretty clear that we learn through adversity when we face challenges because if everything's going great, we just continue the habits that we've had uh, before. So now, this question of how do we learn more effectively from mistakes or failure, I'm going to open it up to anybody who has a comment. But I understand you don't all have to answer. But if you have something burning you'd like to share, by all means. So Sam is burning. Well, yeah, in, the, in the video games industry, so we talk about like failure Learning from failure is this sort of like high level concept. You're going to make big decisions in life. You might fail at those things. You're going to learn big life lessons. Yeah. But the truth is that failure as a means of learning is actually something that like is true at all levels. We take advantage of this in the games industry all the time. Well, give us right? an example. So, what do you mean? So, uh, OK, have you ever wondered why Angry Birds is so addictive? Uh, yes, I have actually. Uh, so, all right. So, Angry Birds takes advantage of this idea of learning through failure and failure being fun. The reason that Angry Birds is so addictive is actually, we didn't invent this in the games business. This is evolutionary. This is evolutionary neuromechanics. Okay. So think back to the first time you played Angry Birds. What happened? The bird hops in the slingshot. You pull it back and you fire at the Tower of Pigs. Yes. You pull it back, you fire, and you miss. Right. And you get frustrated. You fail. You get frustrated. In fact, the pigs laugh at you. Yes. They laugh at you. Yeah. And so the second bird hops in, you pull it back, you fire, you get a little closer to the tower of pigs, but you still miss, and you get more frustrated, and you fail again. And then the third time the bird hops in, you pull it back, you fire, and it's glorious. There's explosions and animations and pigs flying everywhere, and the music changes. All of this is designed to trigger a dopamine release in your brain, which builds up because of the prior failure. This reinforces the neural pathways that you used on the last fire, which is how two hours later you're firing that bird between two narrow obstacles at 50 yards, and why 50 hours later you're still playing the game. We didn't invent this in the games business. This is how your ancestors learned how to throw a spear, right? You fail, and you fail, and you fail, and you build up frustration, and then you succeed, 
and triggers a dopamine release, reward, fun, learning. And in, in, in the sense of dopamine release, it literally is a little addictive. Correct. But it only works if you fail first. Because if all you do is win, 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 you'll never be able to trigger that because you, you need the failure in order to trigger this neurochemistry. Wow, no wonder I'm never addicted because I've never failed. So that, uh, now you I- You just I, made it, you three-starred everything on the first try. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a joke. Let's just be really clear with everybody, joke. Okay, uh, Dorit, what does science tell us about navigating failure, learning from mistakes, et cetera? Yeah, this is really interesting. So most scientists, including myself, are fail 99% of the time. Uh, it's true, I mean, most of your science does not work. Ask any graduate student, ask anybody who's done bench work. It does not work. And keeps us back day in and day out is like you said, Sam, every once in a while, that gel works just right. That experiment works just right. And you're the first person in the world to discover something or to learn something new. So that rush of dopamine is highly addicting, but scientists have sort of learned to live without it for so long, like, seriously, you before you actually get something to work. So it took me a hell of a long time to get my PhD. Six years is probably way above average, but I kept coming back to it, and it, it is that rush of, of discovery. So um, what's interesting about the way we do things is NASA's asked us to, to fail more often, and, I, and frankly, I don't think we're failing enough because we, we really do have a tendency of, of wanting to get those um, successes. And so what we've, de what we've developed at Trish is um, something that we call a queasy factor. So if an experiment or proposal- I'm sorry, Dorit, or, a queasy factor, like a feeling in your gut? Queasy, yes, okay. If it makes you a little bit queasy, wow. it's probably right. And I'll give you an example. So we recently ran a virtual workshop on torpor. And torpor is the state of basically stasis. So bears or squirrels or other types of animals go into hibernation. But what's interesting about those animals is they actually, over the period of the winter time, they're able to go into a state where you know they they lower their um, their metabolism and they and they sleep, but they don't lose body mass. They don't lose um, they lose fat, but they don't lose muscle mass. They, their hearts are fine when they come out of it. So what's interesting about this is that when you were thinking about space flight, there's there's a lot of resources that we're going to need to bring with with us, like food and water, etc. So we ran a workshop on the possibility of really putting people into hibernation in in right. uh, going on a trip to Mars. That made everybody so queasy. I actually got emails from headquarters at NASA going, "What the hell are you guys doing?" And I said, "This is exactly what we should be doing. We should be looking at this." And here's the other thing that was really interesting that happened. We brought in all these amazing researchers from all over the world who were who did um, studies of bears and squirrels and other types of animals. And when we actually Pose the question, how would you do this in humans? They got so uncomfortable. They, they were just so uncomfortable. Really? And it was really interesting to watch this happen. And we were kind of like, okay, I think we're on to something here. So now, let me, let me, if I could interject, for, this is really interesting, Dory. I wonder if some of those scientists who study hibernation and other species, I'm skeptical. I bet that they have many times in the privacy of their own home when no one else is watching, been thinking about how do I do this to a human? Or how do I do this to myself? I mean, the scientists do that. They say, how do I apply this caustic chemical to myself? Will it kill me? I mean, they think about stuff like that, right? So I bet what happened was not that they had never thought about it before, but maybe that they had thought about it and didn't want anyone to know. They were afraid. Yeah, yeah, clearly. I mean, because it was a panel. It was a panel discussion. Actually, that was the most interesting part. Everybody gave their talks. But it was really when we started doing the panel discussion and pose these questions to them that they all got very uncomfortable. Right. I think it was because they were afraid that their colleagues would think less of them. Yeah. And, you know, when you're in your comfort zone all the time, you don't learn much either. I mean, it's when it's when you're getting outside your comfort zone. And that's the queasy part. So Sridhar, uh, let's shift this to how do we learn about, think about what, is mis what does a mistake mean or failure in that, that transition from academia to business? You've been very successful as an entrepreneur. You were obviously also quite successful as an academic, but there are a lot of differences. Give, it, give us an example. 
Yeah. So um, one of the one of the main things uh, is that coming from a technical field or you know engineering science, whatever, oftentimes uh, you know, our bar for technology or innovation or improvement is pretty dang high, and we kind of think, well, you know, we need to be better than this for it to be accepted and valued. Right. And it turns out that when you go to a mass market oftentimes what you need to what the market is ready for and wants and understands is actually down here and in every one of my startups i've had the exact same type of experience and my first company was a medical device company we made glucose meters for people who have diabetes and we had like the most amazing most accurate noise canceling algorithms to make them the most accurate glucometers on the planet well it turns out that when we launched it people absolutely could care less about the, the accuracy what they loved was the fact that we had rubber grips on the side of the uh, uh, of the glucometer they loved the rubber grips because it didn't slip out of their hands what we didn't realize um was that uh, a bulk of the, of the people who used our product were elderly and they had arthritis and had difficulty grabbing it and you know we thought we use research and all that but what we thought was a technological advantage was was necessary but not sufficient in order to uh, go to market with. And then following on with that same theme, uh, at our second company was called Misfit Worlds, and Slava knows it very right. well through uh, the work we did through Indiegogo on that. Um, and it turned out that we came into this world of wearables, fitness trackers, uh, thinking that we're going to hit the quantified self movement. This was um, about 10 years ago, 2011, 12. And we thought it was going to be fantastic. We'd be making a biometric product. Everyone's going to measure everything. And it turned out that the number one feature people liked and wanted was battery life. That was it. Number two, it had to be proof. Not because they wanted to go swimming with it. Washing machine. Because at the time, other just tried to put them in the pocket, jeans go in the washing machine. Right. 100 bucks down the drain and number three it has to look good and not be confined to the risk so nothing to do with the app nothing to do with anything else other than your usability and you know it wasn't easy to some had a battery life of, of, of you know i think it was six months is what we we're able to achieve actually on on, um, on the battery but nobody cared about everything internally what it was was charge it it's going to be waterproof and it's going to look good and right, then right. my current company now is called Elemental Machines, and we're an IoT company, taking everything I learned at Misfit about connected sensors, applying it to all the headaches I had in my first biotech company, which was uh, how do you actually accelerate science? How do you accelerate manufacturing? You know, basically getting data from everything, industrial IoT. Right. And we had a wonderful storyline about uh, all the analytics and the algorithms, and we can find all these insights. The number one request when we went to market was, guys, can we just get a reliable text message when that machine over there starts to alarm, we will pay you for that. Just give us a text message <laughs> when that machine starts to fail. And we're sitting there going, yes, but we can tell you so much more. And the, the, the feedback is, that's great. Give us this now. And I think that's the consistent learning is that coming from an academic or, or technical background, yeah. very often, you know, we're rooted up here for what is advancement, but really what the mass market is actually yeah. far, more, far more fundamental needs. You know, we, we used to, in the dot-com boom, people would say the killer app. But if you looked at what the killer app was, it was there are thousands of things people are trying to do. And then there's that one stupid thing that everyone does a lot of. And then that becomes the success of it. But you don't know what the one stupid thing is. Sam, you were nodding. It felt like you had something to add to this. Oh, well, this one, I mean, so glucose monitors, still terrible. So you're talking about for elderly people with diabetes, being able to hold on to the grip. So I have a five-year-old with type one. Oh. And so I had a jerry-rig hours because the scenario you have with a five-year-old is at two o'clock in the morning, you've got to prick their finger, squeeze the drop of blood onto this tiny test strip, and it's pitch black in the room. And if you turn the light on, everybody wakes up. Yes. So I had to jerry-rig it with a little LED light on the tip of the meter so I could actually see what the hell I was doing at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like, there's a lot of room for innovation in this Well, space. by the way, uh, our good friends and, and your good friend, Lee Shapiro, and the team at Livongo, Glenn yep. Tolman's team, Jennifer Schneider and Lee, Lee Shapiro will be in a trialogue on our finale on Thursday with Anita Vadavata. 
um, you should talk to the Livongo people because they can probably even custom make you a solution. They do. They do good work to that problem. So this stuff is happening really fast. I have one more question, and in a little bit we're going to transition off of this. And we could talk about this for three or four hours. Uh, I'd love to, but we're going to go ask everybody to go to serendipity calls in the networking space on Hopin. But before we do a little bit more, I want to provoke the panelists. Fifty years from now. And there's no magic to 50. It could be 20. It could be 100. I don't care. 50 years from now, we're all still alive. And we're all still feeling pretty good. You have an option, technology, virtual world, the post-virtual world. You have an option to eliminate in your life all small mistakes, all things that are small that go wrong. I'm not talking about the big unexpected events. I'm not talking about running into a friend of yours unexpectedly somewhere. I mean like dropping your keys or forgetting your wallet or your purse at home, or just the small stupid things that happen that are just annoying. You can eliminate all of them from your life. Is that heaven or is that hell? Would you sign up for it or not and why? Who'd like to start? Wait, you're saying I never stub my toe? You never stub your toe again. You never burn yourself on the stove? One never burns oneself, unless you want to. What kind of masochist would want to? Well. That, I don't know. I mean, the people that. What, is this a trick question? Who wouldn't go for this? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's 2020. Okay, so you vote yes. What is he vote, vote yes? yes. Is there a, is, who's going to dissent on this? Well, vote? people do vote in odd ways. We know this. Okay, somebody else on the screen. Uh, do you, is anybody dissent? Anyone not want to sign up for that world? Slava, why is that? I'm okay with life the way it is. Um, you know, all forces have equal and opposing uh, forces. So chances are, if I get that benefit of no mistakes, there's going to be some other issues. Uh, it's kind of like the other movie, which, you know, you have endless time to live. And then all of a sudden, the fact that you had endless time becomes the problem. Yes. Because you're not able to age and be able to appreciate life because you live forever. Uh, so I'm good with it. I like life. I'm not into regret. So I'm good. Great, so thank you, Martin Heidegger. Of course, being in time, he said, all the notion of being and experience, everything is grounded in mortality and the angst of mortality. So I think we got a vote from Slava, a no. See, not everybody would say yes. Dorit, uh, where, how do you vote? Well, I'll be 105 by then, so I'm looking for a simple life without any problems. So absolutely, I'm with Sam. Well, let's say that you were as healthy and ready to go as you are now, and you had this option. How would you answer? You can think about it for a second. Sridhar, what's your vote? So I'm actually with Slava on this. Um, and the reason for that Interesting. is a lot of, a lot of times um, inspiration and innovation come out of those small, uh, small frustrations in life. Um, hmm. And so not having those small frustrations, um, I, think, I think I'm not smart enough to actually come up with anything amazingly huge and I think I'm pretty good at solving small problems. And so I'd be out of a job by then. Okay, hold on. Hold Interesting, on, hold on. yeah, hold Sam, go ahead. Need to okay, fine. Guys, yeah. what if we just got rid of paper cuts and mosquito bites? Uh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, but we have to have a caveat. I don't care about paper cuts. Mosquito bites, if we get rid of them by getting rid of all the mosquitoes, what are we gonna do for the birds? And then the, if the birds die, then what are we going to do for X, Y, and Z? These are complex systems. Now, the if you want to know the unintended consequences. I think birds will find something else to eat. Well, I hope so. But what this suggests, and Slava Rubin's comment about how these systems fit together is indicative of our conversation with David Krakauer that you will see. It's pre-recorded that you will see on Thursday. So another reason to tune in yet again. So, uh, we, uh, so the, here's the answer. The answer is that you should definitely sign up to get rid of all the small. So Slava and Sridhar are both wrong. OK, so anyway, that is the answer. Um, this, has been, this has been great. Uh, I, I think you can tell that I love all four of these people very much. Uh, I'm so glad we could be together in person. I, I, I can't wait to be together with you again. But I have to say that this online thing is, isn't that bad. It, it's feeling better. And guess what? 10 years from now, not a very long time, it's going to be a lot better. So as we learn to that future, experience comes from bad judgment. 
we're all making lots of mistakes all the time, and that's how we become wise, which is just a word we invented to make ourselves feel better as we get older. But what is that queasy factor? And I'd like to make a distinction of Dorit's comment, because I love it. There's the queasy factor that says I'm outside my comfort zone. But there's also the queasy factor that says maybe I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, which is a very different kind of queasy factor. And we have to tell the difference. As we go through life, we keep missing that tower of pigs, but we just keep throwing stuff at it. It sounds a lot to me like our good friend Camus, the intimate optimist, who said, we continue to push the boulder up the hill, and we must imagine that it is good. Thanks so much to Dorit, Sridhar, Slava, and Sam for being with us. Everybody else, and us included, go to the networking segment. Start to meet some random people. You're going to love it. And I'll see everybody tomorrow morning, Chicago time, at 8.30. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. <laughs>